Well, here we are again on another Wednesday evening. Thanks for tuning in to our Bible study this evening. Before we get started in the third chapter of the Gospel of John, I wanted to just remind you of some things and let you know about a couple of other things that are coming up uh, that we're working on. So this Sunday, we will go back to two services. Uh, we will not have child care. We will not have Bible study in between. But we'll have our blended worship service at 845, just like we used to. And we'll have our modern worship service at 1115, again, just like we did prior to uh, our having to deal with this pandemic. And so uh, that will be happening this Sunday. Again, remember, we're continuing to keep uh, the social distancing aspect a part of how we gather so every other pew uh, is to be left uh, vacant and uh, those of you who feel comfortable wearing masks that is fine uh, there are hand sanitizing stations around uh, so just the, the same things we've been doing to uh, to continue to gather and uh, to love one another well and so that starts this sunday our plan tentatively we're going to just continue to monitor the situation, continue to listen to what's happening uh, in our area specifically, but also what's coming from our government officials. Uh, but tentatively, we would like to, uh, to move back into offering child care uh, here in just a few weeks on the 21st of June. And then the plan, again tentatively, is on the 5th of July to move back into having Bible study on site in between the two services. So back to more of a, a normal schedule that we had before. And so that's what uh, we are looking at. You can find those details on Facebook and I believe on our uh, website as well, the, the phases that we're working towards. So that are those are some things to be looking for. A new thing that we are working on right now uh, is, is uh, an event for the whole family. As we've talked about before, we have a strong emphasis and a vision in our church to minister to the families and make sure that Christ is the center of every home uh, and encourage uh, a daily drawing closer to Jesus as we move forward, both individually and as families. And so what we've talked about is the fact that we are a large family uh, made up of smaller families. And so one of the things that we are working on is a family retreat. Uh, as I say that, let me remind you also that on Monday, our students will be going to camp. We've got 38 individuals headed to camp at Highland Lakes on Monday morning, so pray for them. Uh, pray that uh, God would use this to, uh, to, to really grow them and to uh, offer a time to meet one-on-one -on -one with Him. So pray for that. But I mention that not only for you to pray for them, but also to let you know that uh, our children's camp uh, was canceled, and our Vacation Bible School is going to have to look differently. We're not going to do that here for five days straight. It's going to happen on Sunday mornings uh, within the Bible study hour, and so over the course of five different Sundays. So some things we're having to do differently. Well, one of the things we've talked about as a staff is since we aren't going to have the, the opportunity at Camp Zephyr to take our children to children's camp, we're gonna offer something different. We're gonna offer a family retreat at Zephyr. Uh, and so we're mo moving towards that, looking at that. What we're thinking that will look like is a Friday evening, stay the night for those who would like to do that there at the camp, and then uh, have some activities through Saturday, wrap up Saturday afternoon, head back home, uh, get ready for church on Sunday. We're looking at July 17th and 18th for that. You will need to register for that. And as I said, we're thinking of this as uh, a gathering of our family made up of individual families. And so this could be for uh, a family of five with little children at home and a family of one that just wants to come and uh, hang out with the whole family. And so. Uh, we're putting together activities and worship and different things to make this uh, a true family event. And so put that on your calendars, be praying about that and thinking about that. And then uh, the last thing that I'm going to ask you to pray for, uh, specific to what's happening in our church, is I did mention to you this past Sunday 
that uh, we're needing to upgrade some of our media equipment and our services to be able to continue to, to stream uh, in the best way that we can. Uh, we will continue to do that. In fact, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, we'll meet on Sunday for two services. Both of those services will be streamed live. Uh, we've been having to record that because of, uh, again, equipment issues. Uh, we're slowly uh, work in progress trying to upgrade that and uh, so we will uh, have our first attempt this week at streaming both of those services live. So if you feel comfortable coming and gathering here, wonderful. If you're not quite there yet, that's fine. Uh, but we, and you will be able to see that uh, live as it happens on Sunday morning as well. And so that's what's coming. But I ask you to pray because we need uh, some financial gifts to, to finish out what we need to do with our equipment and our services to be able to stream and do it well. And so we are looking at about $150,000 above and beyond our budget. And uh, just ask that you pray about that and seek God in that and how you could participate in that above and beyond your normal tithes and offerings. So those are the things that are coming and just wanted you to be aware of that. The other thing that I would ask you to pray for is right now in our nation, uh, we're experiencing a lot of turmoil, not just the pandemic, but uh, with social injustice and uh, racism that we've dealt with since, as we'll learn today in our Bible study that's been going on uh, since the beginning of time. Uh, it doesn't seem to get better. Uh, and so as a church, as believers, we need to, to pray for, our, church, for our, our nation, for our leaders, and for God's hand to move within our people uh, to truly instill peace and uh, love and compassion for one another. And so uh, make that a matter of prayer as well. Uh, as I said, we will pick up now in John chapter 3. And just see how far we get. The, the last part of this uh, chapter is where we are today. And then we'll move into chapter 4 with the woman at the well. Uh, but let me pick up in verse 31. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth. And speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. The man who accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God for God, and for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son has not seen life for God's wrath remains on him. This follows uh, the last words that we have from John the Baptist uh, before he is imprisoned. And as you may remember from last week, John was being questioned and he said with no resentment that he was not the Messiah. He came to pave the way for the Messiah. And then the verse just before what I just read says this, John's words were, he must become greater, I must become less. So then the, the, the writer of John here, um, the Apostle John, goes in and, and describes why Jesus must become greater and, and John must become less. And, and as we ended our time together last week, as same as for us, that, that Jesus needs to become greater in our lives and our desires, ourselves, need to, to reduce the more room uh, that we make by uh, setting ourselves aside, the more space Jesus can inhabit within our lives. And so Jesus must become greater. We must become less. And the reason is he comes from above. We know from uh, the first chapter uh, that John vividly describes the fact that Jesus was from the beginning, that he created all things. Everything that was created was created through him. He was from the beginning, uh, was with God, and is God. And so we have that uh, picture uh, right off of the bat in, in chapter 1, and then verse 14 of chapter 1, we find that that, that same Logos, that same uh, God, came to earth. 
And so here we, we see that uh, reiterated just in a different way, that he comes from above. He comes uh, from heaven. Uh, he and God are one, and he comes as God to earth. And so, therefore, he is greater than someone from earth. Uh, he speaks things that we don't really even understand because they are from above. The one who comes from heaven is above all. Um, and then he says that we who believe in him have eternal life. Back to what we found earlier in this same chapter, that Jesus came so that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. Not perish, but have eternal life. So we see this reiterated again, uh, this gospel message that whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life. And so John wraps up this chapter talking about the fact that Jesus is above all, that he comes from heaven to earth, and for those who believe in him will have eternal life. So now I want to move to chapter 4 and see how far we get uh, in this chapter there's a lot here that we can understand about the culture of the time, about what Jesus was trying to do, and really about how it fits, I think, in our world today, and the same things that we're still dealing with today in our prejudices and our judgment of other people. And so what we see here in chapter 4, verse 1, I'll just read... Uh, well, I'll read most of this and then uh, come back and start talking about different aspects of it. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. When the Lord learned of, his, of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Let me stop there because I think we can handle this maybe in pieces as we uh, go through this. Uh, what we find here is uh, quite possibly a break in time. We talked just a moment ago about in, in chapter 3 that John gave these words and that he must become greater, I must become less. And what many theologians would say those were his last words uh, that we have recorded prior to his imprisonment. Uh, Josephus and other historians would place John's imprisonment right about this time and so there's a good chance that uh, what we see here, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing. We know that, that people were coming to him. That had prompted the discussions with John's disciples. Why are, why are people going to this one that, that you talked about earlier uh, on the other side of the Jordan and, and not coming to us and this rivalry that we talked about last week? But some would say that, that it's possible that what we see here is John has just been imprisoned and now more people are coming to Jesus and it's prompted the attention, gotten the attention of the Pharisees uh, who were already suspicious of Jesus but now uh, they were seeing that more and more people were coming to him uh, to be baptized and to listen uh, to what he had to say. Uh, this also prompts, well, we, we see here, and I don't want to make a big deal of it, we talked about a little bit about it uh, in chapter 2, uh, but what we see here is, is a reference to the fact that uh, John felt it important to tell us that it really wasn't Jesus baptizing, it was his disciples. Now some theologians would take that as a categorical statement that Jesus never baptized. I don't know that we can do that, and I don't really know that there's a, a reason to to need to fall one side or the other of that, but, but it is interesting that John did point out that, that it wasn't even Jesus baptizing, it was his disciples that were baptizing. But nonetheless, it got the attention of the Pharisees. And then we find he felt the need then to leave Judea and go back once more to Galilee. I think that's important because what we see again in the timing of his ministry is he knew from the very beginning I don't believe that there was ever a doubt in his mind. While from the human standpoint, I know that he couldn't have looked forward to it. But from the beginning, he knew that the cross was at the end. And he knew that that's what was coming. 
But he also knew he had some work that he had to do. He had to bring his disciples along so that when he left them, they would be ready uh, to receive the Spirit and move forward in, in becoming the church and growing uh, this movement in the kingdom of God here on earth. And so he knew that if, if he stayed there, he would, th this, uh, this movement to the cross would probably be precipitated much more quickly than if he got away from the situation. In fact, uh, if you were with us through our study of Mark uh, a year or two ago, as we went through the Gospel of Mark, we found that the first half of the book, every time Jesus taught or worked a miracle or healed someone, he would say, don't tell anyone. And then by the time we get through the mid part of the Gospel of Mark, that was less of an issue. And, and the point that we made there was the fact, again, that Jesus knew that he wasn't ready yet uh, to go to the cross. There were some things he had to do, and he knew, according to what we see here, he knew that if he stayed in Judea, uh, his ministry would be cut short and wouldn't, be, uh, wouldn't get all the things done that he needed to do. And so he decided that they needed to go back to Galilee, leave Judea and go back to Galilee. Now, geographically, I think probably most know this, but uh, the, the, the country of Israel is somewhat narrow and uh, much longer than it is wide. And so we have the southern end of the country, which is Judea, and the northern end, which is Galilee. And in the middle is Samaria. Now, most people, good practicing Jews, uh, would not even step foot in Samaria, would not interact with Samaritans. Thus, uh, one of the things that helps us understand the, uh, the real punch of the Good Samaritan story that Jesus told, that uh, the man that was hurt along the side of the road and the, the rabbi and the priest passed him by on the other side, but the one that helped him was the Samaritan. Um, that was a real uh, confrontational way Jesus was teaching the importance of seeing everyone as important, everyone as created in God's image, everyone as someone that should be loved. And, uh, and so he was teaching that even the Samaritan, uh, the one that you looked down on the most, was the one that showed compassion. So all that to say, we, we go back here to see the fact that most people, uh, practicing Jews of the day, would have crossed the Jordan and gone up through Perea and then come back in uh, to Galilee and not gone through Samaria. In fact, uh, one uh, rabbinical saying was that if you break bread uh, with a Samaritan, if you interact with a Samaritan, it is just as bad as eating the flesh of a pig. And if you know much about Judaism, uh, swine were unclean. You didn't touch them, you didn't eat them, you certainly didn't eat them. Uh, and so they saw Samaritans the same way. In fact, some would uh, say that uh, the Jewish mindset was that the Samaritans were no better than dogs. And so they just didn't have a high opinion of the Samaritans. And we're going to find out part of the reason for that, because really the Samaritans were part Jews. Um, and so let's pick up now as Jesus and his disciples moved straight through Samaria as opposed to going around it. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. What we have here is really a lot of things going on. Uh, not only... Uh, was Jesus alone at the well. His disciples had gone into the market to buy food. Uh, again, this well, this location is uh, right at the foot of uh, Mount Gerizim, really in a valley between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, uh, just uh, 
south of, uh, of Sychar. Uh, and so we have him at this well, this historic site. This well had been constructed and dug by, by Jacob. And the Samaritans held to that. In fact, Samaritans held to the fact that, that they were um, descendants of Abraham through Jacob and through Joseph. Now, the problem with the Samaritans versus the Jews is there was a split because when the exile happened in the 500s and most of the Jews were taken out of the country to Babylon and to Syria, the different exiles, what happened was some were left. Some were left in the country. And uh, the Babylonians sent in colonists to colonize the area. And so you had Babylonian people coming in uh, to Israel and over the course of many years, several generations, what happened was these Babylonians began to intermarry with the Jews that were left there. And this new group of people became the Samaritans. Now the Samaritans hold, held at that point to the five books of the law, the Pentateuch, but they didn't hold to anything else in the Old Testament. They, they in that sense, uh, worship the same God, but because they were in uh, the Jewish mindset, half-breeds, as they would say, uh, they looked down on them. They didn't see them as, as uh, truly God-fearing people, certainly not children of God that the Jewish population saw themselves as. And so there was this bitter uh, rivalry, this bitter hatred, and, and it went both ways. There, it wasn't just that the Jews didn't care for the Samaritans. The Samaritans didn't care for the Jews either. And so what we have here is uh, Jesus alone in Samaria, which from a Jewish standpoint would be taboo anyway. And in the midst of that, a Samaritan woman comes up. Now, we also understand through the Midrash and through the Talmud that uh, it wasn't appropriate, according to rabbinic tradition, for a man to address a woman in public certainly not alone. And so we have this compilation of not only Jesus uh, addressing a Samaritan, but also a woman. And then we find, as we read the story further, that this woman wasn't really even most likely uh, seen very highly by her own people. Because we find that, that when Jesus asked her uh, where her husband was, she said she wasn't married, and he said, you you answered correctly. You've been married uh, five times, and the man that you're with now is not your husband. So obviously this woman, from a Jewish standpoint, was not seen uh, in, uh, in a high uh, light. In fact, uh, most scholars would say when, when we're told that the sixth hour is when this happened, most would say that was around noon. Well, that's the hottest part of the day. And so most people didn't go to the well to, to pull water out and take back to their homes in the heat of the day. Most of that happened either in the morning or the evening or both, but not in the middle of the day. And so most, many scholars would say the reason this woman comes in the middle of the day is because she doesn't, she's not really accepted by the other people in her village and in, in, in her home. And so we have all of this going on that Jesus begins to interact with this outcast Samaritan woman. And, and she sees that. She, she says, this isn't normal. What, why are you addressing me? You, you're a, a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. But we know that Jesus is resting by this well. He's tired. Uh, most often you, you brought your bucket and your rope with you when you came to the well, and so there was no way for him to get water out. And he asks her for a drink. And so that's where uh, we pick up this story Given the time and what comes next, I think we're going to close there. But I want to make some application before I do. So let's, let's just, we'll stop there. We'll pick up there next week. But what we see here is, is really an issue of race, an issue of, of uh, Jesus breaking down walls. And, and we'll see it even more clearly as we move through the story next week. But we see these, these contrasting groups of people, the Jews versus the Samaritans. The very fact that Jesus chose to go straight through 
Samaria as opposed to going around it shows us right there that Jesus saw all people the same. And now we see him interacting not only with a Samaritan, not only with a woman, but a woman who wasn't seen in a highlight even among her own people. What we learn from that is that we need to be reminded that all people are created in God's image. All people are loved by God. God wishes none to perish, but all to have eternal life. Now, it's our choice. We talked about that when we went through uh, John 3, 16 and 17. It's our choice. He doesn't uh, put that on us. But his desire is for all people to have a relationship with him. We need to be reminded that, that we need to learn. As we become more like Jesus, I think we learn more. But we need to learn to see people as God sees them not by their socioeconomic background, not by their race, uh, not even um, by whether or not we deem them a good person. Uh, I was reading a book this week, and one of, the, one of the things that stuck out at me is we have a tendency to see the outside of a person and judge the heart. But we can't do that. God really is the only one that can see the heart. We can see fruit, we can see actions, and we can uh, form an opinion, I suppose, on whether or not a person is doing what they should in following Jesus. But even then, there, there's always more to the story than we can see. And so we need to learn to see people as Jesus sees people. Jesus didn't shy away from Samaria. Jesus didn't shy away from asking this woman for a drink. Uh, and as we'll find as we move forward in the story, he knew her heart already. We need to remember that we are all created in the image of God. An old rabbinic tradition would say that anytime we see uh, a person on the street, that we should envision a, a crowd of angels around them shouting, make way the image of God. Because every person is created, we're told in Genesis chapter 1, in the image of God. And so we should treat one another knowing that every individual is created in the image of God. Every individual is a soul worth saving. Otherwise, God would not have sent his son. So remember that and pray for our nation that each of us would learn to show compassion, learn to see others as Jesus sees them. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for this time and opportunity to look into your word and see how it applies to our lives today. Father, may we see others as you see them. May we take the time, just as Jesus did, as Jesus instructed us and showed us that we should take the time to see the people in front of us and see them as you see them. Give us that ability. Help us to see people with your eyes and see them as people of value, people who you love. And through that, may you use us to love them and show them your, your salvation and your hope and your peace. Use us as your instruments. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Thanks for joining us this evening.